Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. The Black Museum. Affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. In a sanctum mystery. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Retro Radio Sunday on Weird Darkness. Each week I bring you a show from the golden age of radio but still in the genre of Weird Darkness. I'll have stories of the macabre and horror, mysteries and crime, and even some dark science fiction. If you're new here, welcome to the show. And if you're already a member of this Weirdo family, please take a moment and invite someone else to listen, and please leave a rating and review on the podcast app you're listening from. Doing these things helps the show to keep growing. And while you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, my newsletter, to connect with me on social media, and more. Coming up, it's an episode from Lux Radio Theater, which ran for several seasons on different networks. From 1934 to 1935, the show could be found on the NBC Blue Network, owned by the National Broadcasting Company, NBC. After taking a break for a few years, Lux Radio Theater was brought back, this time on the American Broadcasting Company, ABC, from 1943 to 1945. CBS Radio Network picked up the show from 1945 to 1954, and it finally moved back over to National Broadcasting Company, NBC, from 1954 to 1955. In its early episodes, the host was the show's fictional producer, Douglas Garrick, portrayed by actor John Anthony. Doris Dagmar played another fictional character, Peggy Winthrop, who delivered the Lux commercials. Each show featured a scripted session with Garrick talking to the lead actors. Later, the fictional producer Garrick was portrayed by actor Albert Hayes for a couple of years. Famed studio executive and film producer and director Cecil B. DeMille, he took over as the host on June 1, 1936 and continued until January 22, 1945. Of course, DeMille was a very busy man, so on several occasions, when he was out of town or too busy on a film set, he was temporarily replaced by various celebrities who would act as host for an episode. A clash over closed shop union rulings, though, favored by the American Federation of Radio Artists, ended DeMille's term as host of Lux Radio Theater. AFRA assessed members a dollar each to help back a campaign to enact closed shop rulings in California, while DeMille, an AFRA member, but a stern opponent of closed shops, refused to pay because he believed it would nullify his opposition vote. When AFRA ruled those not paying faced suspension from the union, thus a ban from appearing on the air, DeMille was finished in radio, because he also refused to let anybody else pay the dollar for him. Lux Radio Theater employed several hosts over the following year to replace DeMille, eventually choosing William Kiley as the new permanent host a post that he held from 1945 through 1952. After that, producer-director Irving Cummings hosted the program until it ended in 1955. Lux Radio Theater strove to feature as many of the original stars of the original stage and film productions as possible, usually paying them $5,000 each for an appearance. In 1936, when sponsor manufacturer Lever Brothers, who made Lux brand soap and detergent, when they moved the show from New York City to Hollywood, the program began to emphasize adaptations of films rather than plays. And that's what we have tonight – a radio adaptation of the film The Big Cluck, even bringing back original actors Ray Milland and Maureen O'Sullivan to reprise their roles. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, 
starring Ray Milland and Maureen O'Sullivan in The Big Clock. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Some time ago, I read a galley proof of a new book and was so impressed by its screen possibilities that I phoned an executive at Paramount to recommend its purchase, only to learn they had already bought it. That book became Paramount's outstanding example of motion picture suspense, The Big Clock. It's our play tonight, and we're fortunate enough to have two stars from the original cast, <coughs> Ray Milland and Maureen O'Sullivan, with Ray playing a magazine editor with an uncanny genius for tracking down criminals, and Maureen O'Sullivan as his wife. <clears throat> this past week, Mrs. Keeley and I entertained two friends from Siam, who I discovered are enthusiastic users of Lux Toilet Soap. Even in Siam, or Thailand, as it is now called, our product is famous as a beauty care. That was true in the quieter days before the war, when we visited this colorful land. And according to our friends, Lux Toilet Soap is still a favorite. They're on their way home now and are listening tonight from the Pacific as the curtain rises on The Big Clock, starring Ray Milland as George Stroud and Maria Sullivan as Helen. Midtown, New York City. Towering 50 stories above the street is the famous Janeth Building, world headquarters of the incredible business empire known as Janeth Publications. In the lobby of the Janeth Building is a tremendous clock. Its size and accuracy attract hundreds of sightseers daily to the Janeth Building. The most famous privately owned clock in the world, ladies and gentlemen. Its master mechanism, built at a cost of more than half a million dollars, is set so you can tell the time anywhere on the earth. London, Chicago, Honolulu, anywhere. This master mechanism also synchronizes every clock in this building with those in the other Janeth buildings in Kansas City, San Francisco, and the 43 foreign offices of the Janeth organization throughout the globe. Among the dozen different magazines owned by Mr. Janeth is one called Crime Ways, George Stroud, editor. And Mr. Janus wanted me to tell you how delighted he is, George. Why, that's the fifth criminal Crime Ways magazine has found before the police. The fifth in six months. Yes, sir, George. We are proud of you. Now, uh, what about your plans for next week? That's Cordette's problem, Steve. I'll be in West Virginia. Mr. Janus wants you to follow through, George, personally. On my vacation? Postponed. Oh, no, nothing's postponed. This is my honeymoon. Honeymoon? With a five-year-old child? He's six years old. And you know why it's my honeymoon? Earl Janeth. Seven years ago, I was assistant editor of the Wheeling West Virginia Clarion. A happy man. Then I happened to run down a guy the police of three states were looking for. I got a $10 raise. So I married my girl and we go on our honeymoon to her Uncle Fred's cabin at Indian Lake. When we open the door, the phone's ringing. Earl Janeth. Wants me to run Crime Ways magazine. Not next week or tomorrow, but tonight. Two hours later, we're on the train for New York. Think you'd have done better to stay in West Virginia? Look, Steve, put yourself in Helen's position. How would you like to be married to a woman who never had a honeymoon? It's an obsession with her. Is Helen home now? I'll call her up. Nothing doing. Look, for seven years, I've worked 26 hours a day for Mr. Janeth. Christmases, Fourth of July's, Mother Days. What does Janeth think I am? Another one of his clocks full of springs and gears instead of flesh and blood and ulcers? Where is Janeth? I'll tell him exactly what I think. Oh, come in, Earl. I like your office, darling. Pauline, how did you get in here? Oh, the tycoon's lair. The Berktis Garden of the publishing world. <laughs> it seemed impregnable until I thought of your private elevator. How did you get past the guard? Well, he's human. You're the only Superman, darling. Earl, what was that I was just listening to? I turned this switch here and I heard voices. One of them was Steve Hagen's. Oh, you mean you have microphones planted all over the building? Oh, my darling, how clever of you. And obnoxious. Stop this nonsense. 
You don't expect me to approve of your being here? I came about my singing lessons. Hagen attended to that yesterday. He gave you a check. I told you $2,000, not one. Or perhaps you don't think my voice is worth cultivating. Your voice is worth exactly what that check reads. That's all, Pauline. I'm leaving. Immediately. I'm six minutes behind my schedule. I have to fly to Washington at 5.10. I'll see you tomorrow night at 10.55. Of course, darling. And I like your office, Earl. (laughs) Just think. To be able to listen to what everybody's talking about. Yes, Earl Stroud insists he's leaving on his vacation. He's all worked up about it. I'll take charge of that young man myself. And Steve, on the fourth floor in the broom closet, an electric light's been burning for two days. Find the man responsible and dock his pay. Of course. About Stroud, he's meeting his wife at the Van Bath, 12.30. Let him have lunch. I'll get around to him later. Hello? Hmm? I said hello. Oh. Hello. Waiting for someone? Yes, my wife. Mind if I keep you company till she gets here, Mr. Stroud? What makes you think my name is Stroud? Oh, I'm just naturally psychic. Here, give me a hand and I'll tell you what I see. Hmm. Mm Mm-hmm, a very interesting poem. There's been a quarrel about a very unpleasant man, a publisher. Hey, wait a minute. I'm scared of you. (laughs) You don't have to be. You see, I... I was listening to you and Mr. Hagen. Only at the time, I was in Earl Janeth's office. Your voice came through beautifully, Mr. Stroud. What were you doing in Janeth's office? Earl and I are old friends. He once pointed you out to me. Perhaps I should say we were old friends. You know... What you said this morning made me think that we have a great deal in common. You know the inside, and I know the outside. And together we could... Oh, 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 Helen, hey, say, you're late. Oh, 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 this is Miss... uh, Pauline York. uh, Yes, she was telling my fortune. (laughs) Oh, don't let me disturb you. Uh, Oh, it's quite all right, Mrs. Stroud. I'm afraid the psychic vibrations are unsympathetic. (laughs) Goodbye, George. Uh... She is psychic. I'm definitely unsympathetic. Now, darling, let me explain. A, she just this minute spotted me. B, I wouldn't make a pass at her on a bet. And C... And C, you knew I'd be along any minute. Yes, so let's sit down and get a table. Did you pick up the train tickets? Yes. A drawing room on the 722 from Penn Station. Uh, And Tommy's at Grandma's. Oh, George, I still can't believe we're going. Hey, hey, now, that's no mood for a honeymoon. (laughs) Oh, I know. But sometimes I think you marry that magazine instead of me. Well, look, we've got a certificate that says different. Yes, but we don't live that way. We're like strangers sharing an apartment. Either you come dragging home at night too tired even to talk to me, or else you're off having fun with some dancer in San Francisco. Now, I told you that was for an article. Oh, I could write an article, too. How to look at a wall in six easy lessons. Oh, George, we should never have left West Virginia. Why, we'd be a family now, an honest-to-goodness full-time family. Darling, if you just listen to me, I... Well, I have listened for seven years. George, do you realize our son doesn't know you? Why, a boy needs a father. Look, darling, Hmm? look, we're going to have lunch. After lunch, I'm going back to the office. And at five o'clock, I'm leaving the office, and neither snow, nor heat, nor rain, nor gloom of night is going to keep me off that train for Wheeling, West Virginia. Oh, I'm crazy. I'm crazy, I know it. But I believe you mean it. Oh, darling, darling, please be on that train. And, George, I just thought I'd drop into your office and see you. Yes, George, uh, I'm curious... You, uh, you are Mr. Janet? Yes, yes, this job you've been doing of finding people a step ahead of the police all the time. <laughs> What's the method, George? Well, we, uh, we call it the system of the irrelevant clue. Uh-huh. Now, the police only look for the relevant clues. They haven't much time for anything else, not when a case just breaks, you see. But we, uh, we assemble all the clues. We recreate the man, his character, his habits, his emotions... And when you have that pattern straightened out, it's easy enough to figure where to look for your missing man. Well, that's interesting. Most interesting. Now, this Fleming case, do you know how we found Fleming? Seashells. Seashells? Yes. Fleming was a fanatical collector of Paleozoic bivalves. I checked his index and found he had every variety except one. You see? It's up there on the blackboard. 
Now, the only specimen of that seashell in the United States is in a museum in Salt Lake City. So I assigned a man to watch it constantly. Fleming was going to steal it. Well, it, it wasn't for sale. Now, wouldn't you steal something if you wanted it badly enough? <laughs> yes, I might, I might. And, George, you've done a fine job of work for me. Well, I think the real credit belongs to the crime waste staff, Mr. Janeth. Yeah, that's another thing I like about you, George. You're modest. Uh, George, we worked together now for six years, haven't we? Uh, seven. Shoulder to shoulder, comrades in arms, nothing, uh, neither of us letting the other down. Now, uh, George, this Fleming story, properly followed up, should boost circulation 10%. Oh, 15! Ah, that's the spirit. So I'm giving you carte blanche for the next three issues. The... The next three issues? Yes, carte blanche. And then a wonderful vacation. All expenses paid. Uh, South America. West Virginia, Mr. Janeth, and tonight. Now, George, listen to me. No, you really had me going there for a minute, Mr. Janeth. You're a great performer. Then yeah. I'll dispense with the performance, George. Either you, you see this thing through with us, or you're fired. That's okay with me. I'm fired. And I'll have you blacklisted all over the country. You'll never work on a magazine again. It's still okay. I'll give you exactly four minutes to think it over, George. Let Hagen know what you decide. I don't need four minutes or four seconds. Uh, yes? Call for you, Mr. Stroud. A woman. Well, what woman? She wouldn't say. She keeps talking about reading your palm. Oh. Oh, put her on. Hello. Hello, George. And how are you? You want to make a bet? Five to one, your crystal ball hasn't given you the latest flash. I've just been fired. Blacklisted, never to work in the publishing business again. What are you going to do about it? Well, first, I'm going to get myself a good stiff drink. Oh, good, I'll join you. I'm sorry, but I won't have time. This is business, George. You see, the great man thinks he's going to blacklist me, too. But I know enough about Mr. Janet to make him change his mind about both of us. So, how about the Van Barth in, say, half an hour? Oh, but it's almost five, and I, I promised my wife I, I... I think this is one time she'd forgive you, George. Okay, half an hour at the Van Barth. Call my home, will you, Miss Adams? Tell my wife I'll be home at 6 o'clock. Bartender, the lady and I will have two more stingers, and this time make them with green mint. Green mint? Yes, Mr. Janeth hates green, anything green, didn't you know? Who's Mr. Janeth? Never mind. Two drinks, doubles with green mint. Yes, sir. How are you feeling? <laughs> Fine, fine. <laughs> Good. I'm feeling fine, too. Oh, George, it's getting late. Uh, now, about that idea I have. So you uh, want us to write his biography, huh? Janice's biography. Who'd buy it? Well, he'd buy it, Janice, just to make sure it would never be published. Uh, you know, it's a very interesting idea. But it's not for me, honey. Now, what time is it? <laughs> a little after seven. <laughs> Uh, I, I say, what time is it? Oh, well, if you want to quibble, five after seven. Holy smoke, the train, I missed the train. Excuse me, I got a phone home. Well, how's everything at home? She's gone. She went without me. How do you like that? I give up my job, jeopardize my whole career for her sake, and she won't even wait a couple of minutes. Bartender, where are those drinks? Here, with the green... Well, I'll shilly-shally, let's have them. Oh, oh, oh dear, oh. all over me. Oh, here, here, use my handkerchief. Then I've got an idea. Well? Well, you see, Janeth, he loves time. He's in love with clocks. Well, I, I despise time, so let's send him a clock, a green clock. Oh, that's a lovely idea. I... Uh... <laughs> oh, but who who sells green clocks at this time of night? You just leave it to old Uncle George. You finish that drink there, hon, then leave it to good old Uncle George. Let's look for another antique shop, George. It's a uh, cinch they don't have any green clocks here. Hey, hey, wait a minute. That, that uh, painting over there. Oh, George, it's horrible. A painting of a pair of hands. Never mind your opinions. I'll bet that's a Patterson. Yeah, you see, Flora Patterson. Well, if I painted that, I'd never sign my name to it. One of these days, this canvas will be famous. Storekeeper! I told you, mister, no green clocks. How much for the painting? Twelve dollars. Huh? Look, you want it? 
Give me ten dollars. Sold and save the wrapping. I'll put it under my arm. But I'm taking my clock trade elsewhere. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Good night, mister. Good night, lady. Well, so you bought the painting. Huh? Who are you? Oh, just a busybody peeking in store windows. <laughs> Isn't it a pity? The wrong people always have the money. Good night. You know, I think she's pixelated. <laughs> Come on, we'll go to Bert's place for a green clock. Oh, yeah? You never heard of Bert's place as a saloon. Oh. oh, very famous place. Bert's a collector. He collects anything from collar buttons to buggy whips. Why? Well... Pardon me, it's his way of advertising. He's got a standing guarantee to all customers. A free drink to anyone who can ask him for something he hasn't got. I'm all for a free drink. Me, I want a green clock. Come on, it's just around the corner. Oh, what a place. <laughs> I've never seen such a collection of junk in my life. Hey, George, old boy. George. <laughs> well, <are> well, we <laughs> look with you. President McKinley. Pauline, I want you to meet the 23rd President of the United States. The 25th, George. How, How do you do? It's a very great pleasure, ma'am. Oh, thank you, President. I heard you were dead. He is also Colonel Jefferson Randolph of Randolph Farms, Georgia. How do you do, Colonel? We Randolph's man will fight the Yankees till the last drop of bourbon's been shed. <laughs> also Inspector Regan of the Homicide today. As an officer of the law, it's my duty to warn you that anything this fella says may be used against you. <laughs> be seeing you, George. <laughs> oh, who in the world? Radio. Hmm? He's a radio actor. Every Wednesday, he's Inspector Regan. And Fridays, he's Colonel Randolph. And Sundays, he's President McKinley. <laughs> hey, Bert! Where's my green clock? I got it. I knew it. I knew I'd have a green clock yeah. somewhere. Thought you had me, didn't you, Mr. Stone? Here, how's this? A sundial? And a nice green, green ribbon from my dear old mother, Shalini, to tie around it. Well, is this a green clock or isn't it? <laughs> I tell you the guy the one I want. Oh, brother. What happened? Hey, where are we? My apartment, you passed out. Ooh. George, you've got to leave now, right away. Well, you were going to make some coffee. George, Earl Janeth's here. His car's downstairs. Janeth? Yes, he's on his way up. Now, please, hurry. Oh, oh. and take this, too. Our green clock? No, I wouldn't hear of it. I want you to have it as a little memento. All right, just get out of here. Well, it's been a pleasure, Miss York. Oh, George... George, wait till you hear the elevator and then use the stairs. Yes, ma'am. Oh, here. Your painting. An original Patterson. Ten dollars. Don't worry, he wants you. Well, I decided to come back tonight, Pauline. Well, I'll only stay a moment. I was wondering if you had a pleasant evening. Marvelous. Started at the Van Barth and just kept going. Was he with you? The fellow who ran down the stairs as I got out of the elevator? Yes. Yes, he was. Who is he? Oh, just a man. His, his name's Jefferson Randolph. What does he do? Oh, nothing much, I'm afraid. Sort of a playboy. I'm getting a little tired of your friends. Oh, now, that's a shame, isn't the it? The army captain. The lifeguard last summer. The racetrack tout at Saratoga. How many others have there been? Shut up! You. You, of all people. Talking about my friends. What about you and that Artways secretary? And that stenographer? And the girl from publicity? You think they'd look at you twice if you weren't the great Janet? Stop it. Have you lived this long without knowing that everybody laughs at you behind your back? Stop it. You'd be pathetic if you weren't so disgusting. I said stop Why, it. you clammy, flabby, Stop lure. it. Stop it. Stop it. Steve, how can you be so calm? I, I told you I killed Pauline. Not 20 minutes ago. I killed Pauline. Why? I don't know. Forgive me, Steve. I had no right to come here to your home. I'll go. I'll go to the police. Don't be a fool. What about Janeth Publications? Do you want to fight or do you want to quit? Steve, if there's any chance at all of getting out of this, you... You know I'll take it. Of course there's a chance. We've been very discreet about Pauline... No one knows about it but you and I. Now tell me, tell me what you did. I... I can't describe that. You've got to tell me, Earl. 
Thirty seconds before, I didn't intend anything like it. I just don't understand it. I struck her with some sort of sundial, heavy metal. It's still there. Didn't you wear a hat? Where is it? I must have left it there. I'll go to her apartment, Earl. I'll clean things up. Steve, I'm gratified. I always thought you wanted to step into my shoes with Janeth Publications. Not yet, Earl. Janeth Publications aren't through with you yet. Now stop worrying. With any luck, nobody's ever going to know you killed Pauline York. We'll return with the second act of The Big Clock in a few moments. If you love old-time radio, you'll want to visit our friends at ClassicRadioStore.com who provide all the shows for me to wear. At ClassicRadioStore.com, you'll find thousands of episodes available in pristine, digitally remastered sound. Every episode they offer at ClassicRadioStore.com has been transferred from the master recordings and digitally remastered for superior sound quality. That's why the episodes that you hear on Weird Darkness sound so clean. And the shows at ClassicRadioStore.com are all uncut, unedited, and are delivered to you as they were originally broadcast, including the classic commercials. You can download great shows that'll chill you and thrill you, such as Suspense, The Whistler, Inner Sanctum, Lights Out, and more. There are mystery and crime shows like Sherlock Holmes, Philip Marlowe, Dragnet, and Sam Spade. They got a great collection of old-time science fiction radio shows like X-1 or Dimension X. Plus, there is a ton of comedy and westerns there, too, if you want to relive the shows of yesteryear. All the shows are available to instantly digitally download, and the links never expire, so you can order them now and listen to them anytime you'd like. And because you're a listener of Weird Darkness, you can save 20% on any and all radio shows on the website by using the promo code WEIRD at checkout. Just visit ClassicRadioStore.com, select all the radio show packages you want, then at checkout use the promo code WEIRD and save 20% on your whole purchase. That's ClassicRadioStore.com, promo code WEIRD at checkout. And now, our Hollywood reporter, Libby Collins, with news about the stars. And one of the busiest stars in Hollywood, Mr. Keeley, is Joan Fontaine. I attended a studio showing of her latest picture, You Gotta Stay Happy, released by Universal International. That's the second picture made by Joan's own company, Rampart Productions. Yes, and you know, it's really a family affair, because Joan Fontaine's husband, William Dozier, is the producer. So, what with being business partner to her husband and acting the leading role, Joan had plenty to do. She certainly proves she has a flair for light comedy and you've got to stay happy. Teamed up with Jimmy Stewart, the laughs come thick and fast. Well, the picture lived up to its name with the whole cast. Everybody stayed happy to the very last scene. And even though Joan would be tired after a long day on the set, she'd leave her dressing room looking fresh and lovely as ever. I'm sure John Kennedy could tell you the reason why. Oh, that's easy, Libby. All Lux girls know what to do for a quick beauty pickup. Especially when there's a cake of that big, new, bath size Lux toilet soap handy. My, what a refreshing beauty bath it makes. That generous bath size gives more of the creamy Lux soap lather. Screen stars love the Lux soap perfume, too. A light, delicate fragrance that really lasts. Lux soap's perfume is a triumph of blending, Libby. The fragrance of rose jasmine, lily of the valley, and lilac are just a few of the ingredients. No wonder screen stars recommend the new satin smooth bath cake. It's so luxurious. Women everywhere are thrilled with Lux toilet soap in the generous new bath size. If you haven't tried it, why not put it on your shopping list tomorrow? Here's our producer, Mr. William Keeley. Here's the second act of The Big Clock, starring Ray Milland as George and Maureen O'Sullivan as Helen. Earl Janeth made no mistake when he picked Steve Hagen as his second in command. Hagen's gone to Pauline's apartment. From her purse, he's removed a man's handkerchief and a check for $1,000. He set back the time on a broken clock, picked up Janeth's hat, and taken the sundial. Now, after a long talk with Janeth, he's telephoned George Stroud. But George isn't at home. George is in Wheeling, West Virginia. 
Don't you understand, Helen? I was detained. I took the first plane I could get. Oh, I was so angry when the train left without you. It was unforgivable, George. It was unforgivable you're leaving without me. Well, what was I supposed to do? Wait at the station till our golden wedding? That's exactly what Janeth wanted. Darling, I got news for you. I've hmm? quit. For good, forever, and for always, I quit. Oh, I don't believe it. We're unemployed and penniless. Oh, it's too good to be true. Blacklisted for life, never to work on a magazine again. Oh, George, how wonderful. <sighs> Why didn't you phone me? Oh, darling, I had 18 million things to do. You just can't clean up seven years in five minutes. Oh, I've been so miserable. Were you miserable, too? Miserable? Mm -hmm. I was desolate. I walked the streets like a zombie. You uh, didn't meet any blonde fortune tellers on the way, did you? You're not serious. Yes, I am, George. I'm very serious. I can stand a lot, but that's one thing I just couldn't take. Well, darling, that's something you'll never have to take. You're the only blonde in my life. I'm a brunette. Well, you're the only brunette, too. Don't answer it. Well, hadn't I better? No one would call if it weren't important. Hello. George, Steve Hagen. George, we've got the story of the year. It's a natural for you. Haven't you heard, Steve? I quit. That's telling him, darling. But, George, this is important. The payoff man in an enormous war contract scandal. Find him and you'll get a bonus. Six months vacation. I'm on a permanent vacation right now, and you can tell Mr. Uh, wait Janet a minute, George. I'm... George, wait a minute. I'll put him on. Don't want to talk to him. This is Janet, George. I behaved very badly yesterday. I apologize. Well, that's, that's very big of you, Mr. Janeth. George, as servants of the public, it's our duty to find this man. The trail is still fresh. He was around town last night with a blonde. We know they were at the Van Barth in some place called Burt's. What? What place? Burt's place. You know who the girl is? No, and we don't care. We're only after the man. His name is Jefferson Randolph. Randolph? I'm not going to rest until I've exposed this scoundrel if I have to assign every man in our organization. Well, I, I'll grab the next plane, Mr. Janeth. George, if you leave me now, I'll never speak to you again. Darling, I have to. Why? Why do you have to? Janeth says it's a war contract scandal. But that's just a blind. He's trying to find out who's been playing around with this girl. I happen to know the man. Well? He's a victim of circumstance. I've got to go back. I've got to keep Janeth from finding him. It would wreck his life. His life? Well, what about our life? Helen, please. I've got to go back to New York. <laughs> Just call the airport, Earl. Stroud will be here any minute. Steve, do you think he can do it? Find Jefferson Randolph? Yes, he's a wizard at finding people. Pinning the murder on Randolph, maybe something else again. Oh, uh, about the sundial, Earl. There was a tag on the bottom, stolen from Bert's place, it said. So I brought it back to the saloon. Brought it back? No one saw it. Kept it under my coat. Earl, are you sure this Randolph fellow saw you last night? He couldn't help but see me. I was directly under a light. And if you're smart, Steve, you'll send my wife two dozen roses or something. She came back with me, but she's not at all happy about it. Of course, George, of course. Now about this Jefferson Randolph. A war contract scandal, huh? Yes, we know nothing about him. Only that he and a very pretty blonde were at the Van Barth last night and later at Burt's place. You can assign anybody you want to this case, spend all the money you think necessary. But we must get results, and quickly. Where did you get your information, Steve? Uh, a confidential source. Earl and I are pledged not to reveal it. Okay. I'll get the staff together, check back with you in an hour. Uh, George, remember, forget the blonde. All we want is Jefferson Randolph. Hello? Hello, operator? I'm ringing that number for you now, sir. Okay. Hello? Bert's place. Bert? Yeah. George Stroud. Oh, how are you, Mr. Stroud? Look, Bert, I can't go into details, but you haven't seen me all week, understand? And definitely I wasn't around there last night. I get it, Mr. Stroud. A little wife in trouble, huh? Well, something like that, Bert, but not, don't let me down. Don't you worry, Mr. Stroud. I never even heard of you. Thanks, Bert. Much obliged. <laughs> Miss Adams. Yes, sir? What about that Butterfield number? It still doesn't answer, Mr. Stroud. Oh, there's a phone for the apartment house. Maybe they'd know if Miss York went out. I told you not to mention that name. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Stroud. Well, forget the apartment house. I want to speak to the party directly. I'll try again in a few minutes. Hey, George, George, we got something. Come in, Cordette. Mr. Spalding just phoned in, found a witness. Said he saw a couple of black hours near Burt's place at 10.30 last night. The man had a painting under his arm. 
A painting of a pair of hands. What about the man? Any description? Oh, awful vague, George. The witness was too busy staring at the blonde. Well, put what you got on the blackboard. Bert's place, 10.30. Oh, George. Oh, come in, Steve. Couldn't that be one of your famous irrelevant clues? What? The picture, the painting of the hands. Oh, yes. Yes, it might be at that. And if he had it under his arm, maybe he just bought it somewhere in the neighborhood. Well, I'll uh, sign a man to check. What's the matter with you? Put six men on it. Check every art store and antique shop in the neighborhood. This could be red hot. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Cornette, get every available man in here right away. Blackboard's starting to look like something, George. As of exactly 12.17, here's where we stand. Name, Jefferson Randolph, tall, medium build, black hair. Was wearing single-breasted gray suit, well-tailored, blue tie. Frequents the Van Barth and Burt's place, collects paintings, character questionable. Mrs. Straub, Vincent's on the phone. They've located five Randolphs. No, I'll get it, George. Hello? Look, put Vincent on Kislav's phone. Kislav, assign a man to each one of those Randolphs. Routine check with form double A. Okay, okay, fine. That was fence, George. Another break. That painting came from an antique store on 3rd Avenue, and the artist's name is Patterson. Well, sounds like our man may be a collector. Well, what do we do about it, George? Hadn't we better get on it? <laughs> What's the name of the chief critic on Artways? Oh, a fellow named Klaus Meyer. Yeah, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll send him over to see Patterson. Patterson? Patterson? Hey, of course, I've seen some of her paintings in your home. Look, why don't you interview Patterson? I can't leave here. The way we're going, we'll have Randolph inside of three hours. Look, you better grab a bite to eat, Cordette. You may not have a chance later. Yeah, yeah thanks, George. I just tried the Butterfield number again, Mr. Stroud. Still no answer. Well, skip it. I'll try it myself later. Oh, uh, Mr. Klausmeyer's on the phone. He said if you're busy, you'll call Mr. Hagen. Hagen? No, no. Klausmeyer, this is George Stroud. Have you seen Miss Patterson yet? I just this second left her. I think I've got something, Mr. Strong. Well? The girl this Randolph was with, well, her name is Pauline York. She wants model for Starways. Patterson recognized her. She was standing outside that antique shop last night when Randolph bought the painting. And the girl was with him. I'm going over to see Miss York right now. I'll call you back, Lacey. No! No! Hey, wait a minute! Hello! Hello! Miss Adams. Yes, sir? I'm going uptown. Find Cordette and tell him to take over. <laughs> Who is it? Uh, this is Mr. Klausmeyer. I'm from Artways Magazine. I'd like to see Miss York, please. Hey, why? Why, Mr. Stroud. Hello, Klausmeyer. Looks like I got here first. Oh, well, yes, it does. Uh, you've seen Miss York, then? Yes, yes, I've seen Miss York. Got all the information we need. Now, let's get out of here. Are we going back to the office, Mr. Stroud? No. Well, well... What did Miss York tell you? Who's the man? Jefferson Randolph, manufactured from Pittsburgh. Klaus Meyer, hop on a plane right away. Find out all you can about him. But Mr. Strat, uh, Pittsburgh? This is an order right from Mr. Janet. Oh, oh, yes, of course. Call me the minute you arrive. I'll wire a thousand bucks expenses. Incidentally, who have you spoken to since you saw Miss Patterson? Well, I phoned you right away. I, I haven't talked to a soul. Good. Now, there's a cab at the corner. Now, get to that airport. I don't even have a tooth. That's the spirit, Klaus Meyer. Hey, Mac. Uh, you the doorman here? Uh, yes, sir. Well, look, for ten bucks, would you happen to know a Mr. Janeth? Mr. Janeth, yes, sir. Did you see him around here last night? Well, not before midnight. I go off duty at 12, sir. Uh-huh. Well, tell me, does Miss York happen to have a maid? Well, sure, but you won't find her. She started a vacation last Monday. Oh. Well, where would you get a cab around here at, say, uh, oh, one o'clock in the morning? Uh, two blocks east. Oh, well, thank you, sir. Here's George now, Earl. He's been out on the case. Well, George, we're making progress, eh? Fine progress. In time, eight hours, and manpower, the efforts of 46 employees. And results, enough information about this man, his whimsicalities, his charming manners, his penchant for green mint stingers and modern paintings to write a biography. Just one thing, George. Where is this man? I don't know, Mr. Janeth. You don't know. But I've placed the blonde. Her name is Pauline York. How did you discover that? I just left her apartment. Did you talk to her? I couldn't very well on account of she was dead. Well, that doesn't seem to be much of a shocker to either of you. George, why do you think we've been conducting this frantic search? How'd you know she was dead? Uh, 
Her maid discovered the body this morning. She telephoned Steve. Steve? Uh, yes. Uh, Miss York was a protege of Steve's, George. Well, why didn't she call the cops? Uh, uh, Steve asked her not to. We want to trap Randolph ourselves. Big feather in our caps. But what makes you so sure that Randolph killed her? Who else could it be? Well, how about Steve here? She was his protege. It's a very strange suggestion, George. But I telephoned Steve at his home last night. I was speaking with him at exactly 12.32. Within seven minutes of the time the murder took place. How do you know? Miss York had a clock on the table. It was broken in the struggle. Oh. Oh, then you've been to her apartment. The maid reported it. What's the matter with you, George? Nothing. I, I just can't understand why you're both so sure that Randolph killed her. Suppose an investigation proves him innocent. What investigation? Well, an inquiry around the apartment house. Witnesses who saw somebody else enter or leave. You have such witnesses? No, no, but I'll sure look for them. Unless you decide to let the matter drop. Aren't you going to great lengths to protect this Randolph? I'm just trying to keep an open mind. It almost seems as if you had some inside knowledge of this matter, George. Hello. Yes, Cordette, he's here. You have? No, oh, excellent, excellent. Well, George, you can forget about your investigation. We have our man. He was seen entering this building not two minutes ago. Steve, I want emergency orders issued at once. Close the building and block all exits. Nobody is to leave unless identified. Identified? Identified by whom? Why, George, didn't you know? Oh, but how could you know? You just came in the building yourself. No, what? Your very efficient department has found the antique dealer who sold the painting to Randolph. They brought him in an hour ago. Take the dealer down to the lobby, Steve, immediately. <laughs> Come down to the lobby, George. Well, I, I think it's a waste of time, Cordette. Well, don't you want to meet him, the antique dealer? Spalding and Dixon found him not a block away from Birch Place. Well, that's fine. That's great. But who says Randolph's in the building? Miss Patterson, the artist, claims she saw him step in the elevator. Ah, uh, George, I certainly got the hand it to you. You'll have this thing solved. Why didn't you tell me Patterson was here? Well, how could I? You've been with Mr. Jonathan Hagen. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. Well, it's far more important that I see her than play house in the lobby. Oh, uh, what about the fire escapes, the emergency exits? All guarded. Nobody leaves except through the lobby. Patterson in my office now? Yeah, with Miss Adams. Well, let me know how they're doing in the lobby. Yes, Miss Adams? Miss Patterson's still waiting, Mr. Stroud. Well, I, I'm on the phone. I'll be with her in a minute. Hello? Superior Cab Company? Look, I'm trying to locate one of your cab drivers, Casimir Kowalski. Oh? No phone. Well, how about his address? 16 East 31st Street? Thanks. Send her in, Miss Adams. This way, Miss Patterson. Oh, you! You're Mr. Stroud? Oh, it's very amusing, really. <laughs> Pardon me while I laugh. Miss <laughs> uh, Adams, you better go down the hall and help Fraser on the blackboard. Uh, yes, sir. Well, I'm pleased that somebody likes my work. Well, I've admired your work for years. Uh, well, what am I supposed to do now? That codfish, Mr. Klaus... Uh, Kla Klaus Meyer. Uh, yes. Well, he said I'd get $100 if I'd make a sketch of the man who bought my painting last night. And then somebody else called and said he'd give me another 50 if I came down here and identified him. Plus the cab fare. That's one hundred and fifty-one fifty-five plus a ten-cent tip. Well, I'll give you a cash voucher right now. Shall I start the sketch? Uh, that won't be necessary. Oh, uh, Mr. Stroud, I've few enough collectors of my paintings without sending one to jail. Well, this will take some explaining, believe me, but if you... Oh, <laughs> nonsense. What did you do? Oh, never mind. With all that hue and cry downstairs, it must have been something terribly lurid. But I don't mind. I can't wait till I tell the children. Children? Oh, uh, yes. Here. Here's their photograph. Ugly little cherubs, aren't they? All these yours? More or less. <laughs> now, uh, that one's Ralph's, my first husband. Drank himself to death. And these three are Frederick's. Lost at sea. And these two are Willie's, whom I refuse to discuss. And the twins here are Mike's. Your present husband? Well, he would be if I could find the rat. <laughs> oh! Oh, my goodness, this voucher. It says $500. I said I was an admirer of yours. Oh. <laughs> By the way, what did you do with my painting? Well, it's quite safe, Miss Patterson. I took it home. 
Now look, uh, about the sketch. Does it have to look like me? <laughs> you know, I've been attracted lately more and more to surrealism, Mr. Stroud. Uh, let me see now. An electric fan. Exactly. The man I saw last night was an electric fan. Bzz, bzz, bzz. Paper, please. Pencil, pencil. I've heard all about what's going on from Miss Adams. My, that's quite a blackboard you have there, John. Oh, Helen, I knew you couldn't stay away. Not after what I found in our bedroom. Found in our bedroom? Yes, that terrible painting. Oh, darling, look, Liz, I, I, I can explain everything. Look, all I want to know is Look, what... let's go into my office. Oh, no, 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 I can't. She's in there, Miss Patterson. Who? Who's in there? Oh, never mind. Helen, if you'd only hey, give me... Yes, Tony? I just got the bartender at the Van Barth. Oh, hello, Mr. Stroud. He says Randolph spilled a drink on the blonde. Fine, fine. Bird on the blackboard. And that she mopped it up with his handkerchief. She put the handkerchief in her purse. George, what if it has a laundry mark on it? What goes the laundry mark without the handkerchief? Huh? Oh, yeah. Okay, I'll put it on the blackboard. Oh, you see what I mean, Helen? I'm going nuts. Take your hands off me, Jefferson Randolph. What? Helen, I've got to talk to I you. I bet you do. All about wrecking an innocent man's life. Listen to me, please. I'll tell you the whole story. But why didn't you go to the police when you found she was dead? And spend the next 90 years in jail? Janeth can rig up a dozen alibis. He can sell his soul to him. So what a dozen others. Me? All I got is myself. Well, what about the taxi driver? Or did you just invent him? Invent a guy named Casimir Kowalski? You could invent anything. Miserable. Desolate, walk the streets like a zombie. And all the time, there you were Darling, with Darling, that... look. Listen to me. Hmm? I know where Kowalski lives. Here's the address. But I can't get out of the building. Now, unless Kowalski comes here and identifies Janet, that antique dealer down in the lobby is going to identify me. George? Yeah, Tony. Mr. Jan just called once in his office right away. Okay. Oh, if I ever get out of this jam, I'm going right back to West Virginia. Oh, if I could only believe that. I'll cover church, socials, write obituaries, set type anything. That'd be wonderful. But you won't. Well, I... I better see Janet. I guess I'll be back. Who knows? There's no doubt about it, George. That man Jefferson Randolph is one of my own employees. Moreover, he's in this building this very minute. I want him smoked out, George. Use the guards. Mobilize everyone. Get that antique dealer and start a floor-by-floor -floor search of the entire building. Yes, sir. I'll put O'Brien on it. He's your personal bodyguard. He ought to be... Not O'Brien, George. You and the antique dealer. Do you understand me? Yes, Mr. Janeth. I understand. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. In a few moments, we'll bring you Act 3 of The Big Clock. If you love old-time radio, you'll want to visit our friends at ClassicRadioStore.com who provide all the shows for me to wear. At ClassicRadioStore.com, you'll find thousands of episodes available in pristine, digitally remastered sound. Every episode they offer at ClassicRadioStore.com has been transferred from the master recordings and digitally remastered for superior sound quality. That's why the episodes that you hear on Weird Darkness sound so clean. And the shows at ClassicRadioStore.com are all uncut, unedited, and are delivered to you as they were originally broadcast, including the classic commercials. You can download great shows that'll chill you and thrill you, such as Suspense, The Whistler, Inner Sanctum, Lights Out, and more. There are mystery and crime shows like Sherlock Holmes, Philip Marlowe, Dragnet, and Sam Spade. They got a great collection of old-time science fiction radio shows like X-1 or Dimension X. Plus, there is a ton of comedy and westerns there, too, if you want to relive the shows of yesteryear. All the shows are available to instantly digitally download, and the links never expire, so you can order them now and listen to them anytime you'd like. And because you're a listener of Weird Darkness, 
You can save 20% on any and all radio shows on the website by using the promo code WEIRD at checkout. Just visit ClassicRadioStore.com, select all the radio show packages you want, then at checkout use the promo code WEIRD and save 20% on your whole purchase. That's ClassicRadioStore.com, promo code WEIRD at checkout. Tonight's guest, Miss Carmen Rigo, must have one of the most exacting jobs in Hollywood. She's hairstyle supervisor at Universal International. A very resourceful person, Miss Rigo. Well, each picture presents a new problem, Mr. Keeley. And even a man knows that being a hairstylist calls for ingenuity and, uh, well, patience, doesn't it? More than that. Creating coiffures for the world's most glamorous women is a challenge. Take the Countess of Monte Cristo, for instance. Sonia Henney's latest picture, in which she proves again she's queen of the ice. Miss Henney's new leading man, Michael Kirby, adds to the thrill, too. He's Canada's former figure skating champion. To see them streaking over the ice together and spinning like mad is sheer delight. So you can guess why Miss Henney's hairdo was a problem. It had to stay in place. And how did you solve the problem? For the Countess of Monte Cristo, we clipped it fairly short and then brushed it into soft, flat curls. If I do say so, she looked adorable. Perhaps, Miss Dorigo, you'd like to tell the ladies in our audience what you think about hairstyles in general. My feeling is that short hair will be the fashion for at least three more years. As a suggestion for evening wear, those pin-on pieces are wonderfully effective with the current period fashions. But I know Mr. Kennedy will bear me out when I say no matter how fetching the coiffure... The effect is lost unless it frames a lovely complexion. That's right. So, uh, it must be a great satisfaction to you, Mr. Rigo, to have all those lovely Lux girls to work on. I should say so. Sonia Henney tells me she wouldn't think of neglecting her daily Lux soap facials. Says they give her skin just the gentle, protecting care it needs. Thank you, Miss Carmen Rigo, for reminding women everywhere of a simple complexion care that really works. A care that nine out of ten famous stars depend on. There's no doubt that Lux Soap facials make skin lovelier. Skin specialists have proved it. In actually three out of four cases, complexions became softer and smoother in a short time. Why not try Lux Toilet Soap tomorrow? This fine white soap with a delicate fragrance is Hollywood's own beauty care. Now, here's our producer, Mr. William Keeley. The curtain rises for Act Three of The Big Clock, starring Ray Milland as George and Maureen O'Sullivan as Helen. It's a few minutes later, in a private elevator that has just started up from the milling lobby of the Janet Building, George Stroud faces a terrified antique dealer. But it is you. You are the man they are looking for. You bought that painting last night in my shop? Look, you... look, wait a minute. you got to keep calm now. Take it easy. They said you were an official here. That you... Are you having a thing to worry about? It's just that someone was murdered, uh, that's all. Murdered? Yeah, they think I did it. At least they're trying awfully hard to pin it on me. Murdered? What are you going to do to me? Well, what would you do in a spot like I'm in? You'd stall for time. Time to get proof that you're innocent, even if it means... <coughs> having to suck a nice little guy like you smack on the button. I'm sorry, pal, but that's the only way out. Where's that artist? Where is she, Steve? She'll be right in here. She's got that sketch of Randolph about finished. Uh, did O'Brien get back? What about the driver? Did he find the cab driver? O'Brien's back. It cost you $5,000, but the cab driver's leaving town. Goodness, what an office. Now, which one of you is Mr. Janet? Uh, just sit down. Uh, give me that sketch. I think I've captured his mood rather successfully, don't you think? Well, here, look. And just what is this supposed to be? Get her out of here, Steve. The woman's an idiot. Mr. Hagen, Mr. Hagen. Yes, what is it, Tony? The antique dealer. Well, what's he doing here? He says Randolph jumped him in the elevator. I fought. I struggled. No use. He was enormous. But you got to look at him. Such a face I will never forget. And that wild glare in his eyes. Warn everyone, Steve. Authorize them to shoot if necessary. Tell O'Brien, shoot to kill. And Tony, you get Stroud in here. That's just it, Mr. Janice. Stroud's disappeared. Maybe Randolph slugged him, too. Oh, the bartender is here from the Van Barth. Hold him in the reception room under guard. And find George Stroud. Helen. Helen, in here. What in the world? Where have you been? I've been going crazy. What are you doing in that room closet? Is the corridor clear? Well, at the moment, yes. 
But Look, they're all you... looking for me. That antique dealer, he saw me. I had to knock him out. Where did you go? Casimir Kowalski, the taxi driver. I went to his house. And? Gone. The neighbor said he came into a sudden legacy. Oh, sure, sure. A sudden legacy from old Grandpa oh. Janet. That's all I needed. Well, I'm going to call the police. And turn me in. Oh, it's better than having you shot. The guards are running around here with guns in their hands, and they've been ordered shoot to kill. Oh, oh come on. Hagen's office is empty. We'll go in there. Oh, why did you ever have to do anything with that woman? I told you I didn't have anything to do with her. There must be some way out of this mess. Oh, give me a cigarette. Well, I don't have any. Isn't that a cigarette box? Take one of Hagen's. Maybe I should go to Janeth. Try to make some sort of a deal with him. Here. Here's a cigarette. What's that? It's a handkerchief. What's it doing in a cigarette box? Let me see that. Well, well. What do you mean, well, well? It's my handkerchief, the one in Pauline's purse. There you go again, Pauline. How did Hagen get it? He claimed he was never up there. Why couldn't we pin this job on Hagen? We'll put him in such a hole, he'll have to implicate Janeth. Well, who are you phoning? Burt's place, a friend of mine. He's always in Burt's place this time of day. I'll... Hello? Oh, this is George Stroud. Let me speak to the president. The president? Yes, President McKinley. Now, look here, George. I really... Well, what's that? Interrupt his phone. Yes? This is Hagen. Claudette just saw you go into my office. Are you looking for me? Uh, yes, yes, Steve. Uh, my wife is here, and I didn't uh, want well, her Well, Mr. To... Jenner's in your office, and we want to see you at once. Is that clear, George? Well, I... I'll be right there. Helen. Yes? This guy at Burt's place. When he comes to the phone, tell him to get up here as fast as he can. He's a radio actor, a friend of mine. And where will you be? Not in my office. Tell Hagen you don't know where I went. Now, there's a room on the second floor, the place where the works are for the big clock. I'll hide there and wait. Call me when McKinley gets here. Extension 381. Stroud's disappeared again, Earl. His wife claims he left my office to come here. I don't get it. 250 people, 12 hours and 43 minutes, and we still haven't found Randolph. Right here, Steve, in our own building. Earl. Earl, look. What? The clock on the wall. It stopped. Mr. Hagen, the clock stopped in here. Well, why shouldn't it stop? What's the matter with that? But you issued orders never to stop the clock for anything. Why shouldn't it stop for once? It's a mechanical thing, isn't it? It can go wrong, can't it? It started again, see? What? The second hand's moving. Yes, that's strange. That it should start again. O'Brien. Yes, Mr. Janet. Go down to the second floor, O'Brien. See if anybody's in the clock room. Who's in there? I said, who's in... Oh. Hello. George. Did you get the president? Yes, yes, he's here now. But George, are you all right? I'm fine. Two shots, but he missed. What? Look, there's a conference room on the 16th floor. I'll get up there as soon as I can. George, George, what happened? Never mind. Hello, Prez. I came right over, George, as soon as I could. Yeah, thanks. Look, we've got to work fast before that thug gets out of the elevator. Who? What thug? O'Brien, Janet's bodyguard. He'll be coming up after me. I just shoved a letter opener inside the elevator door. It broke the circuit. Now, he's stuck somewhere between floors, but it won't be forever. What can I do, George? Well, you stay here with me. Helen, find Janet. Janet and Steve Hagen. Yes? Tell them to come in here right away. Tell them I've nailed our man. <laughs> This man, George? Is this the one? This is Jefferson Randolph? Uh, no, no. Uh, this is Inspector Regan of the Homicide Detail. Mr. Earl Janeth, Mr. Steve Hagen. Yeah, how do you do? But, George, you said that you had the man. Inspector, would you mind stepping outside for a moment? I give you my solemn word, nothing irregular will occur. That Hagen fellow, George. I've seen him before somewhere. Look, he's editor-in-chief here. Now stay in the corridor, Mac, till I call you, will you? Right. And, Inspector George, I thought I told you to keep away from the police. Yes, until we had the murderer. Well, I'm afraid this is going to be a shock. There's our man, Mr. Janeth, Steve Hagen. What? Steve? George, this is a very serious charge. I wouldn't be making it if I didn't have the evidence. Evidence? Why, the witnesses have all seen me. The antique dealer, the bartender, Miss Patterson. Why, they talk to me. Oh, I'm not saying you're Jefferson Randolph, Steve. But I am saying you murdered Pauline York. Why? Why would I kill her? Blackmail. He's been giving her money by check, Mr. Janeth. The bank will verify that. Absurd. Is it? Cigarette? Not now. 
Go ahead, Steve. Open the box. You need a smoke. Thank you, no. You're afraid to open the box. Why? Because this handkerchief was in there. Isn't that so, Mr. Hagen? How about it, Steve? The handkerchief that Miss York got from Randolph at the Van Barth. Here. Notice the green stains. And where would Steve get this handkerchief, Mr. Janet, except from the purse in Miss York's apartment? Did it occur to you, George, that the maid might have brought it to me? The maid's been away on her vacation, Steve. Gone since last Monday, and that's not all. There's a cab driver who took you from Pauline's apartment. I don't seem to see him around, that cab driver. Because he was bribed to go away. But I've got the address he took from you. Got it by phone from the cab company's files. Here it is, Mr. Janet. 323 Sutton Place. That's Steve's address. There's your evidence, and it'll stand up in court. George, you've had a brainstorm. Anybody could have taken a cab to my address or planted that handkerchief in my cigarette box. As for the maid, I... I think I can produce her if necessary. Earl saw her this morning. Didn't you, Earl? Uh, uh, yes, yes, of course I did. Well, let's see what they say about it at headquarters. Helen, would you ask Inspector Regan to step in? I'm sorry to have had to do this, Steve. Come in, Inspector. Hey, well, Mr. Stroud. There he is, Inspector. Hagen. Police Inspector, eh? What sort of a gag is this? I've seen this man, Earl, half a dozen times in Burt's place. A broken-down radio actor. George, I'm beginning to get an idea. Maybe some of the witnesses should get a look at you. Well, haven't they? No, only that crackpot, Miss Patterson. As a matter of fact, George hasn't seen one of the others. Only the antique dealer. Just before he was slugged. Hey, just a minute, Hagen. Bert's place, huh, Hagen? Did you see me there last night, late last night, when you sneaked that sundial back into Bert's collection? Sundial? Yes, he didn't think anybody saw it. He had it under his coat. The murder weapon. And the witness who saw him try to get rid of it. Well, I guess that just about wraps it up, Mr. Janeth. Now I suppose we phone for a real cop. George, in a minute, in a minute. Well, uh... Steve... I, uh, I know how you feel about me, Steve. You're the most loyal employee I've ever had. I'm not going to let you down, Steve. I'll put every resource we have at your disposal. We'll fight this through for you, no matter how long it takes or how much it costs. You're not going to be alone, Steve. Every bit of influence I... Mr. Hagen. Mr. Hagen. That's you, Cornette. What is it? Oh, George. Well, we've searched every office now except Steve's and Mr. Jonas. No sign of anyone. The search is off, Cornette. Send everyone home. Oh, but Jefferson Randolph. Who is he? We are not interested. Just do what you're told. Uh, yes, Miss Hagen. But I'm not going to jail, Earl. You insufferable egomaniac. You thought you inspired such adulation that I'd do anything for you. George, Janeth killed Pauline. You'll swear to that in court? Of course I will. I can prove that he... Get will... out! <laughs> Stay there, all of you. I'll kill anyone else who tries to come after me. George, George, no, you heard what he said. He'll... Janeth, don't be a fool! Janeth! <laughs> George, George, are you all right? Sure. What about Janeth? Janeth is dead, Mac. Oh. Cordette, keep him outside, please, all of them. I'll tell you later. Call the police, Mac, will you? Where is he, Mr. Janeth? Well, I chased him down to the next floor. He went for the elevator. The elevator door was open a few inches. I told you how I jammed that letter opener to break the circuit. Well, Janeth must have thought the elevator was there. He pushed the door open, and that's that. Oh, it's him! Miss Patterson, what are you talking about? That's George Stroud. I know, but that other man... Jefferson Randolph? No, he's my fourth husband, Mike Darling! No, no, no! <laughs> well, darling? Huh? I guess you'd better call the police. President McKinley is all tied up. <laughs> Ray Milland and Maureen O'Sullivan are back at the footlights, and that applause says they're guilty. Guilty of a fine performance. And that's the verdict, huh? That's the verdict, Ray. Then I guess Paramount would never forgive me if I failed to pick up the cue and mention that the title of the next Paramount picture in which I act, and I use the word loosely, is the sealed verdict. Paramount has forgiven you. And now, since Maureen and her husband John Farrow, who directed The Big Clock took a trip to Ireland after finishing the picture, I think we should get the word on that. Well, is the Emerald Isle still green, Maureen? It was just beautiful, Ray. We took four of the children along to see their grandparents for the first time. Oh, four of them? 
Well, I didn't know there were more. Oh, yes, I have five. I can't see why anyone would want only four children. <laughs> How <laughs> this girl must clean up on Mother's Day. <laughs> <laughs> it must have been a wonderful vacation. I remember the beautiful Irish countryside. A long, quiet, restful trip. Bill, have you ever traveled 10,000 miles with four children? Well, <laughs> I guess I wouldn't know about that. But this I can be sure of. It must have agreed with you because you never look lovely. <laughs> well, thank and you. I hope... Yes, th the answer is yes, Bill. I always use Lux soap, and I still do. I take it with me wherever I go, even to Ireland. And uh, incidentally, five children can use up an awful lot of soap. Well, um, I'll see what I can do for Thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell us, Bill, uh, what kind of a show have you lined up for next week? We have a distinguished play and just the stars to go with it, Ray. The play is a screen hit from across the ocean. The prestige production of Noel Coward's Brief Encounter. And the stars, I need only say, they're Greer Garson and Van Heflin. This is the story of a strange romance. Two people who found love in a chance meeting with a cast a producer dreams about in Greer Garson and Van Heflin. That sounds wonderful. Good night. Good, Good night. night and come back soon. <laughs> Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Greer Garson and Van Heflin in Brief Encounter. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. Maureen O'Sullivan appeared by arrangement with Paramount Pictures, producers of The Night Has a Thousand Eyes, starring Edward G. Robinson and John Lund. Heard in our cast tonight were William Conrad as Janeth and Bill Johnstone as Hagen. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. And this is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear Greer Garson and Van Heflin in Brief Encounter. Reliance Spry, S-P-R-Y. For lighter, finer, richer tasting cakes, Spry tops any other type shortening. Spry's amazing cake improver takes guesswork and hard work out of cake making. Try Spry's one bowl method for glorious cakes. For all you bake and fry, rely on Spry, S-P-R-Y. Be sure to listen next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Brief Encounter, starring Greer Garson and Van Heflin. Stay tuned for My Friend Irma, which follows over these same stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Thanks for listening to this week's retro radio episode of Weird Darkness. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio and leave a rating and review in the podcast app you listen from to help spread the word about Weird Darkness and Retro Radio Sunday. And a huge thanks to our friends at ClassicRadioStore.com for generously providing the old-time radio shows you hear on Weird Darkness Retro Radio Sunday. Remember, you can save 20% on all of the ClassicRadioStore.com shows by using the promo code WEIRD at checkout. The rest of the week, I narrate new stories of the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, and mysteries, so be sure to subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already done so. I upload episodes seven days a week. You can email me anytime and find all of my social media links on the contact page at WeirdDarkness.com. Also on the website, you can listen to free audiobooks that I've narrated, shop the Weird Darkness store, sign up for the newsletter to win monthly prizes, and more. Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marlar House Productions. Copyright Weird Darkness. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.